Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. You know, one of the issues that comes up fairly frequently nowadays among parents and educators alike is the issue of what are students being taught at school today? And that's a really good question for your tax money. In this video, I'm going to explore that a little bit, focusing on the nature of knowledge and the nature of learning, as well as how the ministry or government is going to achieve their grand designs, as well as in a balanced approach of things after all pros and cons, what is one thing that you can do as a parent to connect with and help your child meaningfully at home or children or as an educator to teach more efficiently? Let's get started at the top. Today education is much influenced or is dominated by liberal thought. As a result, creativity now is a, an educational outcome or a prescribed learning outcome. In the classical liberal position, the schools, the government mandates that schools produce people, students, who are able to do the following. And this is a generic description without any reference to any particular state or government or province. So, students need to be motivated learners, have an explorer mindset. Students need to be able to think in new ways outside the box, so to speak. Students need to solve future problems yet undefined, especially to feel future jobs that are yet uninvented. And students need to define set rules or past rules and past authoritarianism. This is a fairly liberal description and a tall order. Do notice that in the language of this description of curricular outcomes, this, the language of business is reflected with employability being a top goal with future jobs and future problems. So in order to meet this, educators need to match it with a matching education that delivers a, and, has, and has a general direction for learning but doesn't have, that isn't overly prescriptive and doesn't have too many detailed educational outcomes. So this is the reason why in some instances when your child come home, comes home and you ask, well, do you have homework? No. Oh, what happened at school? Nothing. What are you learning? Nothing. Or, I don't know. Conversations could go something like that between parent and child. So, this might be the reason, at least in part, for it. Educators at school also need to teach by using learner-defined, problem-based teaching methods. And this is also really difficult to bring home. In all honesty, problem-based um, activities stay at school. Okay? They, you can, they are not really transferable. And educators need to provide for learners with ample opportunity to reinvent the wheel. This is done, the problem based teaching is done through group work with students interacting with each other and any homework for this, much of the work is done at school so it's not really transportable as homework. It, the interaction needs to happen at school. That's also why some of the the conversations go uh, weird between just the generational gap between parent and student. So, this would be the uh, a generic wording of the, this classical liberal positioning curriculum, <clears throat> but it immediately brings up typically the following questions in uh, my experience. Will learners really invent a new alphabet, for example, to define how they want to write? How much room is there for reinventing the wheel? How much time is there for reinventing the wheel? And is it reasonable to expect students to really conclude E equals MC squared when we needed an Einstein to do that? Or A squared, B squared, C squared, or anything in math? or physics. So, this brings us to a broader discussion about the nature of learning and the nature of remembering. How do you remember things? How do you learn things? 
And how do you want learners to learn things in school? For example, when it comes to conventions in spelling, do you really want to give students all the creative freedom they can have to spell in any which way they like, hoping that one day by the end of the course, by the end of the year, by the end but whatever deadline, they would be able to produce a written piece that is intelligible by everybody else? How do you remember simple things or learn simple things like the names of the months? You know, there are 30 days in September, April, June and November, whatever. How do you memorize things? How do you remember the magnitude of metric prefixes such as, you know, which one is smaller, the milli or the kilo? The milli. How do you remember these things? And this brings us to this one in blue. How bad is pre-digested knowledge? How bad is rote learning? Remembering just spelling rules by giving the students rules and memorizing them, committing them to the memory. Multiplication table, the steps of long division, anything. The scientific nomenclature, how it works, or just anything that school deals with. How do you want learners to remember and is pre-digested knowledge and rote learning really bad? Well, the liberal answer for from the people who make these types of curricula is uh, typically backed up by arguments that feature noted philosophers and uh, educators such as Paulo Freire. And I'm going to use his name in this uh, Brazilian Portuguese uh, version because that's how Brazilian Portuguese people on 44, this is another website, pronounce it. Just listen to Paulo Freire. There. Or Paulo Freire. Or Paulo Freire. Okay, you get the idea. So, I'm going to go with Paulo Freire. In his seminar book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which was written in 68 but translated in English in uh, 1970, something like that. Freire, the educators, liberal educators' argument is that Freire backs up the problem posing education, thereabouts, problem based teaching, learner defined problem based teaching, by claiming that Freire himself says that in a problem or that problem posing education bases itself on creativity and stimulates true reflection. This problem posing education in Freire's system is opposed to what he calls the banking style of education. So this problem posing education is the good guy in Freire's system because it, it's based on creativity and this, this stimulates true reflection. He also writes people develop their power to perceive critically. That's good, that's what's in the new curriculum, that they want people who can think for themselves somewhere. It's, it's in thinking new ways and think for themselves. That's good stuff. Freire also writes that through this problem posing education, knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry of human beings pursuing the world, with the world, and with each other. He says, only. And that's where the problems begin. Does knowledge really emerge only through invention and reinvention and the rest of this stuff? Maybe not is what my answer is. Now, liberal educators and, and, the, and these types of curricula that produce children or students with these kind of abilities and who get this type of education delivered to, they will be using loosely Freire's, very loosely, Freire's system, but he's not the only educator or philosopher who communicated somewhat similar uh, thoughts uh, from Montessori and Dewey. There's a long line of educators. I just picked one, Freire. So, this problem-posing education is contrasted in Freire's system 
with the banking concept of education, so the banking concept is the bad guy, okay? Where knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing, something like that. Projecting an absolute ignorance onto the students, a characteristic characteristic of the ideology of oppression, this banking concept of education negates education and knowledge as processes of inquiry. The teacher presents himself to his students as their necessary opposite by considering their ignorance absolute. He, the teacher, justifies his own existence. So, this is Freire's description, or one little bit how he describes the banking concept of education and the rule of knowledge in it and in, in, the, in the process of learning. Also he writes, the teacher's task in this banking, in this bad system of education, the teacher's task is to organize a process which already occurs spontaneously to fill the students by making deposits of information which he or she considers to constitute true knowledge. And in this bad banking system of education, students are not called upon to know, but to memorize the contents narrated by the teacher. Nor do students practice any act of cognition. Since the object towards which the act should be directed is the property of the teacher, rather than the medium evoking the critical reflection on both the teacher and the students. So, in Freire's description, the banking system of education, memorizing is not knowledge. Memorizing is bad. Memorizing is uh, useless deposits of information because it isn't acquired with interaction with each other in the world and with the world because true knowledge really emerges through this process among which invention and reinvention is also listed. So, this, these descriptions from Freire and other authorities back up these kind of educational learning outcomes and this is problematic because he wrote in 1968, it notes that it's old stuff because in considering, I don't know, millennia of um, educational achievements starting from, I don't know, A square, B square, C square, I think that was uh, ancient Greece. So, in the grand scale of things, Freire is not too old, but he didn't really write about the nature of knowledge and the nature of learning. His focus was the pedagogy of the oppressed and oppression and how oppressive systems are transferred through certain forms of education. So his focus is slightly different. Now, this brings us to an issue of a grammatical number. Very briefly, grammatical number is very simply, in English we have singular, plural, singular meaning one, plural meaning many. And nouns have singular and plural forms, book, books, leaf, leaves, child, children. But in between one and many, in English there is at least one more number between one and many, it's the number two. This is called in grammatical number a case of dual. Words like twin or between or betwixt or both or together or either or neither nor or other have this sense of two. Either is a choice between two things. Together is relating to two people. Okay. Both is not the same as all. All is plural, both is dual. So Freire's system has a sense of duality or in other words a binary system. The oppressor and the oppressed with nothing else considered in between. And this has a long history in philosophy. Just to mention a few examples, it's not an exhaustive list. For example, Freire read writings of Marx, who wrote about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie in a class fight against each other, as well as before Marx 
Hegel wrote about master and slave throughout history, Egyptian pharaohs and slaves and everything from antiquity or since antiquity. There has always been a master, there has always been a slave, something like that. Now, this grammatical number of duality, and you can see there are two terms to master and slave, uh, bourgeoisie and proletariat, and uh, as well as oppressor and oppressed. This binary system is prone to f follow a logical fallacy, not necessarily number 17, I just wrote a number there, but the false dilemma by definition is a dilemma where your options are reduced to two, when there are actually more than two options. It works with your kids if you don't want to prepare a 14 item lunch list. You can just ask them, so what do you want to eat, hot dog or hamburger? But in reality, between, between day and night, uh, what do you do with dawn and dusk and sunset and the things that are between day and night? So not necessarily everything is binary. In in terms of this binary affecting curriculum design and making sense of what goes on at school, this binary system is a this, this binary thinking is a system that sets boundaries and an enclosure around thinking, and this is significant because if all you see just work with these two symbols, a vertical line and another one looped like this, this could be interpreted in one system as number ten or could be interpreted as number two. Well, how is this number two? Well, in binary math, where instead of ones, tens, hundreds, you have ones, twos, fours, eights. This is zero in the ones column and one in the twos column. This is the number two in binary. Or this could be in Italian, as in io sono something something. It's a personal pronoun I in Italian. My point is, again, that the system of thinking frames the boundaries of thought. My argument here is ex nihilo nihil fit, attributed to Parmenides of uh, Elia, that's his name in Greek. The saying here is Latin, out of nothing, nothing comes, but he's a Greek guy. So what this means is that is it reasonably expected or, or is it a reasonable expectation that people would invent on their own, out of nothing, the conservation laws of energy or momentum or mass or anything in math and science or physics that has taken humankind thousands of years to debate and argue and develop and finally conclude that all things fall at the same speed regardless of their masses. Galileo versus the Pope, I think you remember they had a little bit disagreement there, except that friction with air and air resistance messes with the system. So is it reasonable to expect people to develop a new alphabet to learn to in order to learn to write? Probably not within the realms of practical. So Freire is when it comes to backing a liberal educational system, Freire is not really the best choice to do that because on the surface he looks like he writes about bad knowledge, but in fact he writes about oppression, using education to oppress people. So Freire's quotes about the nature of knowledge and the nature of learning are only remotely applicable to a new curriculum. A better way to look at this, what can you do as a parent? Use a mix of direct instruction and use some memorization, as well as it in a way that it's not oppressive, like Freire says, and in a context that provides for the students ample room so that they can reinvent the wheel to some degree, because there is a reason why it's taken humankind thousands of years to invent the wheel, the axle, you know, everything, the bearings, the fire, bow and arrow, whatever. So allow students some room for memorizing without being oppressive 
in the classroom or in the school system as an institution as well. And Isaac Newton used this quote, you know, when he was asked, Mr. Newton, how did you see further than anybody? How did you come to your marvelous discoveries? And he said, by standing on the shoulders of giants. He didn't invent this saying. This has also been around since antiquity. He just used it in one of the letters, for example, that he wrote to uh, Robert Hooke in 1676, uh, if I remember right. So, standing on the shoulders of the giant means it's okay, I think, to use some memorization, to use some rote learning, to cut to the chase in education and not drag it out too much. Uh, not necessarily using problem-based learning for every single skills that's out there to learn. Memorize the multiplication table with rote learning, if it's faster, but without being oppressive. Something like that. So, for references, thank you very much for listening. This is the major book that I used beyond, beyond little tidbits of uh, Newton and Parmenides and uh, Marx. As well as if there's any question about the authorship here or the contributors to this video, there you have it. Thank you very much again for watching.